boys and girls, Doug Childs here. It's Warriors Rich and Wild Man. What's happening, Doug? I'm happening, you're happening, and I think I see somebody sitting next to you. And I believe, if I'm not wrong, Rich, he's been on Warriors and Wildmen before. For the uninitiated who have not heard Dave, uh, introduce our guest. Man, he's your buddy. He's yep. your amigo. You're in the studio. I can't be there because I'm in the great Republic of Texas <laughs> holding down the fort because if we hold Texas, we hold America. So what's going on over there in Yuma, man? Yeah, this is my friend Dave Klukey. We've had him on before. And uh, for the Warriors and Wildmen listeners, I'm, I'm sure you remember that episode. It was it, a couple episodes. They're really powerful. And, and Dave, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me again. I really yeah. appreciate it. It's great to be back. And uh, I I'm going to read Dave's um, bio a little bit of it because I think it's important. I think too many times, too many times we get on the internet and the internet tries to make everyone equal. It's like some 13 year old kid has the same opinion, the same weighted opinion as someone who's a scholar and a subject in it. So I think a lot of times we, um, because we become familiar with people, they're our friends. We know them, but maybe somebody listened to Warriors and Wildmen, they're listening to this for the first time and they don't know Dave. And so I think it's good to put, um, his opinions and the things that he shares in context. So I want to read a little bit of his bio. Dave served over 20 years in the U.S. Army Special Forces Green Beret. Green Berets, he spent more than five years deployed to combat and other global operation assignments in a variety of leadership positions for commanding from commanding a Special Forces A-Team Special Forces Company in combat to overseeing highly sensitive U.S. global counterterrorism initiative, initiative. So you could just put right there, i.e. Dave's a badass. You can just put that in there. Dave's awards include the Legion of Merit, five bronze star medals, Special Forces tab, Rangers tab, numerous other U.S. and for, uh, foreign decorations and awards. That's cool. Green Bray and Ranger tabs. That's, that's cool. I'm a glutton for punishment. What there you say? go. A glutton for punishment. I love it. He's a lifetime member of Special Forces Association. Um, He's a member of the Amer uh, Arizona Veterans Medical Leadership Council, Military Order of, the, of World Wars, and was elected as Vice President of Family Programs for the Arizona Chapter of Association of the United States Army. He also volunteers as a keynote speaker for Veterans Heritage Project and was inducted into Circle of Distinction for Association for Career and Technical Education. And here's the part that I all that none of that's surprising when I met Dave. This stuff is surprising, not because uh, he lacks depth in conversation, but you don't <laughs> typically put those things with these things. He's a graduate graduate of Georgia Southern University, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, earned a Master of Science in Defense Analysis, specializing in irregular warfare. That, that's an interesting um, subject from the Naval Postgraduate School. He's currently attending exec. No, you finished. I just graduated. You just graduated. This has to be updated. He just okay. graduated the executive MBA program at Arizona State University. Come on. That's awesome. Oh, so, yeah. Dave, that's that's pretty awesome. But that's seriously, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm not a person that, that flatters people and, and we've had great conversations before, yeah. but that's impressive, bro. Seriously, thank you so much for your service. And, and I know you've paid a high price. I, I know there's a reality to that. And too many people watch television and have ideas of that. But I know as you, you as a person, and it's impossible to do what you've done and that not take a toll on your life. But also it adds to, we were talking about earlier, emotional strength that made you who you are today. Oh, absolutely. And so I, I'm thankful for what you did and for what you still do. And I'm thankful for you as a friend and really appreciate you coming on Warriors thank you. and Wildmen today. Thank you. Oh, it's great to be yeah, here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, and when he was going through that litany of accomplishments and stuff, I'm sitting there thinking about these entitlement mooks, these Bernie bros <laughs> that are living in mommy's basement that, you know, have opted out of high school or they quit their undergrad school at Tweedle Your Ballsack Junior College. And <laughs> there they are with no ambition, with all kinds of grass growing underneath your feet. That kind of stuff that that uh, that you have done, uh, not only from a warfare standpoint and, and going into to battle, uh, multiple times, but just from an academic aspect, again, you don't hear about that much in this uh, United States of liberal acrimony. So thank you for yeah. uh, being a pie pit and nut cutter, man. And here, here's another thing too, Doug, that I think is important. We read that and it's like, oh yeah, and he got an MBA at this. We can read that in two seconds and people can pass by it, but that equals hours and time. That equals yeah, dedication hello. and money. <laughs> yeah. That's not like, you can read that, people can tune out and not pay attention, but the only people that do that are the people that have never done anything and understand the significance of all those things. Anyone who's done anything pays attention 
to a person's accolades, like you said, and says, wow, I know that all of those things cost time and commitment. And so that's a big deal, man. So we just yeah, want to bring coming. you on until you're a great guy. Thanks for coming, Dave. Hey, Warriors great. and Wild This man. was like the best show That's ever. Thank, Thank you. you We're out. <laughs> it's kind of like Patrick Byrne, uh, Rich. Here yeah. He is the CEO of Overstock, a uh, billion-dollar company, and just, you know, in- incredible dude. Dave, he gets cancer like two or three times. Yeah. So most people, most people would have, yeah, most people would have milked that, you know, pity me, sorrow, sorrow, sorrow. He's like, you know what? I'm going to learn Chinese while I'm doing cancer treatment. I think he got two MBAs, two MBAs a PhD and, yeah. <laughs> while he's got cancer. Yeah, and, I asked uh, him that. Remember that, Doug? I said, right. well, you got all of these degrees in your 20s. And he said, well, I had cancer, so I couldn't go anywhere. And so I just <laughs> just got a couple MBAs and a PhD. Nobody so, knows. yeah, I had a guy in my MBA class overcame brain cancer. That's impressive. Yeah. And, you know, he graduated with me, but he had to take a break for a little while. And, you know, it came back just because of the nature of the treatment. But this guy was brilliant. Probably one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my entire life. And I've met some really smart people. And he was just impressive. And the only thing that, you know, superseded that was his, really his resilience and his intestinal fortitude to continue forward and complete his MBA. While he was working, couldn't go anywhere because of COVID and risk because of the brain cancer and his treatment and the medication and everything else. Yet he still finished it. Unbelievable. I tell you what, man, uh, I was listening to this guy the other day and he was talking about, um, I don't know, psychiatrists, sociologists, psychologists, I can't remember. But some expert was rattling off about people when they retire from their job, they have nothing to do and they usually die within about two years. Mm -hmm. And he said one of the things that keeps people lit, keeps people on the edge is a problem constantly in front of them, some kind of difficulty, you know, to put in a stranglehold and to solve. And so I think people's brains go to waste. I think their, you know, vision, you know, becomes blurred if they don't have some kind of Goliath, some kind of beast that they want to tackle, that they want to uh, confront, they want to overcome. So most people, you know, they're like, I don't want any problems in my life. I don't want anything Mm. to deal with. And uh, what the psychiatrist, these, these guys aren't pastors. These aren't theologians. What the psychiatrist said goes, no, you need that. You Mm -hmm. need a burr in your saddle. You need something you know, that you've got to uh, uh, overcome and tackle, or you're just going to go to waste. You're going to go to mush. You're going to watch 50 hours a week at Netflix. And uh, yeah, you'll be dead in two years and your wife will remarry somebody and spend all of your money. (laughs) Yeah, there's, you you make me think of two individuals and I just got to bring them up. And uh, one is a guy named Nick Lavery. He's still serving and he overcame incredible adversity. I think he's got like four Purple Hearts shot all over the place, ended up being an upper leg amputee, ended up getting infected. So they had to go a little higher. And this dude is like Man Mountain Dean. He's like 6'6", like 275, just gigantor. And he ended up instead of, you know, a lot of people would fold up. I lost my leg. What am I going to do now? No, not this dude. Uh, He ends up going through, completes the Special Forces Combat Diver course, like one of the hardest courses in the entire Army. You know, and he becomes the first special forces warrant officer. And before he did, or with an upper leg amputee, and before he did all that, he fought his way back onto a team. He's like, no, I'm, I'm not going to retire. I'm not going to medically retire. You could easily do that. Mm-hmm. I'm not done yet. I've got stuff to do. And he yeah, and, did it. And Dave, doesn't he have to requalify also? Well, he had to do an operator assessment in third special forces group and every group has it. And they had him do this rigorous train up, physical rehabilitation, uh, sports there, all of this. And then he had to do an obstacle course and he had to complete all these milestones and tasks in order to get back on a team. And he was the first guy to do it. And he deployed to combat, right? So, I mean, he, he does all this. So I measure, I try to measure myself. I'm like, okay, I need to do more because there's people like that out there. And then there's Brandon Kaznick. This guy, he got shot. He got wounded and he's paralyzed and he's still in the fight. And this is years ago now. And he has opportunity to go get some surgeries so that he may be able to walk again. I mean, you talk about never quit attitude. These are the folks that, you know, when I'm not doing enough, I'm like, oh, man, I got to get up. I got to do more. You know, I'm, I'm clearly lazy because <laughs> they're out there just crushing it and, and overcoming incredible adversity and, you know, being pretty much the, the mantle of human resiliency. So 
yeah, anytime you're like getting a high score in a video game and you don't want to get out, <laughs> you know, yeah. think of these folks. It's like they're really doing stuff That's and setting great. examples for everybody. Yeah, it was, I, and that reminds me um, how we can lead into the topic. I, I had sent you a, a video recently of Jordan Peterson. Oh, yeah. Talking about PTSD and jo Jordan Peterson's brilliant. And, and um, I'm not going to do him justice, but I'll just give a quick synopsis of what he was saying. He said, synopsis, he said, um, people have PTSD a lot of times because they are sheltered and, and don't understand the difference between good and evil. And so when they experience evil, they fold. And he said, but a, the major cause of it isn't what they've seen or what other people have done, but a, lo a lot of people struggle with what they are capable of doing. And so that's a hard thing to get over. And, and I thought that was significant. I sent it to Dave and Dave said, yeah, that's, that's part of it. That's one part. And, uh, and then he sent me a text. And so I, I want to lead in with that and, and let you pick up from there if you wouldn't. And I think that will tie into your shirt too. It says, do, do not give in to the war within and veteran suicide. And so we're talking about PTSD, but PTSD could be from a lot of things. Like I have a friend that's in the Tempe police department and they just had a mom who killed her two kids and they were the ones that were there. And then there was another, um, another case of kids being killed just within a matter of days. Yeah. And that's a small group, a, a small uh, police department. So he's dealing with that. They're, they're first ones on the scene. So those are realities, right? So it's not just yeah. special forces. Nope. So I, I think a lot of times, and, and I know that you'll touch on that too, but I think a lot of times we think, well, I, I'm not a Green Beret. I'm not in combat. But people do experience PTSD. And it's, it's not a cop-out. It's identifying a problem. Absolutely. So that you can move towards, you know, so you, so you don't stay there. Turn the page. Yeah. Move to the, the rest of your life, hopefully the best of your life. And so let's talk about that. I sent that video to you and, and then yeah. your response was. Yeah. Um, well, this is kind of a story. And, um, you know, I, I quietly suffered with PTS for years. And, you know, quietly because the, you become really two versions of yourself. You become what everybody sees and then what happens at home when nobody's looking except those that you love most. And unfortunately, it becomes um, debilitating over time. And for me, uh, you know, I did some serious damage and I'll readily admit it to my family that we're overcoming and just because of where I was and, and I did some serious damage to myself. I wore literally two hats for years. I'm bright, I'm happy, everybody sees what I want them to see. I was wearing a mask and it, it got to the point where, you know, I'm, I'm gonna say this for others out there, uh, don't think you're alone. Um, I had the gun to my head um, and that's, I reached a really low point. Um, and I, I looked up at the moon, my wife just got in a, in a fight and I'm like, this is it, I'm gonna do it. And the only thing that kept me from doing it at that moment is I heard my kid's voice from the other side of the house. And that we realized that I, I needed treatment. I tried different treatments and they didn't work. Uh, <laughs> nothing worked. Um, so I ended up going to this place called Warrior's Heart and a, a really close friend of mine told me about it. I trusted him. And then I reached out to another guy because I'm suspect and cynical of everything. I got to make sure that I do my due diligence and analysis on it. And he's like, you come in here, you be honest, and it will absolutely work for you. Uh, you just have to be honest. I was like, okay. So, um, you know, I, my wife was done with me. She kicked me out. I was like living at buddy's houses there, you know, and here I am. I'm still, I have to suspend the NBA. You know, my kids are like, what is going on? Why is daddy not here? You know, what happened? And, you know, it was a complete sugar, honey, iced tea show. <laughs> and that was where I was. And this was resultant from my retirement. Um, I wasn't ready to retire. Uh, the transition was really hard for me. And I had bottled up a lot of these things that I stuffed way down inside. And the only reason I was able to sustain uh, was because I was so busy all the time uh, with work, deployments, everything else. So um, once I retired and everything came to a screeching halt and you can only volunteer or study or do so much, and, you know, it, it just came to the front. And, of course, all of this is exasperated through poor coping mechanisms, alcohol, um, you know, it, it makes everything a lot worse uh, within moderation, right? <laughs> but I'll tell you that, it you know, when I went to Warrior's Heart, I was angry. And I was angry because I was holding forth a lot of resentments. I lost a lot of close friends. 
uh, a lot of friends in combat. Uh, I can go to one area of Arlington National Cemetery, and I, it's like a reunion. I know everybody there. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's, you know, very, uh, it's hard because you remember their lives, you know their families, you know their ultimate sacrifice. And I was hold, held resentments against, uh, believe it or not, different commanders that I thought made bad decisions and didn't do everything that they could for their people. And that bothered me. I'm like, if you only said no to this or listened to them, they'd probably still be alive right now. So I was carrying all this around. It was, it was very heavy, you know, a very heavy backpack of stuff that I, that I moved with me. And for me personally, uh, my PTS had nothing to do with getting shot at or blown up or stabbed or, or, sh- or shot for that matter. I mean, it, that stuff doesn't bother me. And I asked, asked the providers, like, is there something wrong with me? I mean, this, this doesn't. She's like, no, that's actually pretty accurate because of your level of training and what you do. I'm like, okay, good. Okay, so can, we can roll out the sociopath, right? She's like, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, and, but well, you bo- tricked them on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what bothered me uh, was the loss. Uh, loss of potential, loss of a future for the folks that, you know, our Americans that, that we, and, and our partners that we went over there that, you know, were willing to put everything out and um, we lost them. And that, that really, really bothered me because I felt like I didn't do enough. And that's part of PTS. Hmm. It's called a, um, it's a traumatic injury that, you know, um, so I was carrying a lot of those around because I, I always want to do more. I always want to make sure that I cover everything but you can't as a human. You can do everything you can, and you have to reach acceptance. Right. So that's something I discovered. But when I showed up to this place, there were people, like some of the people going there, are they're all veterans, but some guys and gals are either coming from prison or going to prison. And they're like scared of me. They're like, that is the angriest dude I have ever <laughs> seen in my entire life. Don't make eye contact. And, uh, you know, that was me when I went in. I was, I was full of rage and resentments and all of this. And, you know, I, I was angry at God, believe it or not. Um, I felt like he failed. And, you know, it was, it was tough. So, um, you know, I'm going through this program. And like anything else, I'm, I'm suspect. And I'm like, ah. So we have this thing. And we end up talking one night and somebody in there, I'm like, you know, I'm angry. What do I need to do? And he's like, well, you need to find God. He was like, you need to, you need to like reassess and find God. And he said it kind of dismissively. And that made me even angrier. (laughs) (laughs) So some guys approached me after class um, or after it let out. One guy in particular is like, look, you know, um, you know, and he explained some miracles that he saw and he explained some things that he saw in his life that, that helped him. I'm like, well, dude, you're right here with me. He's like, yeah, I know, man. I, I, I got to gotta re-engage too. I'm like, well, let's go do it. He's like, well, I'm not ready. I'm like, oh, you're killing me. I'm like, I'm going right now. So I like, I go find this old oak tree and it's, it's dark out and no, no, you know, I'm creeping over there. Nobody can see me. It's nighttime. And I have my, my Lieutenant Dan moment with God, you know, like I wasn't in a boat. There was no thunderstorm, <laughs> you know, I have my legs fortunately, but I literally like had it out with him. And I'm like, you know, I'm sure it got pretty loud and people were like, Oh, don't worry. That's just the angry guy. He's good. <laughs> so I had it out. And then, you know, I asked him, um, I'm like, look, you know, I, I want back in. I want back in your flock. I want, I want to be, you know, just please let me back in, whatever, whatever it takes. So I go to bed, you know, I wake up the next day, and then the weirdest thing happens. Um, one of the guys there has a book, and he walks up to me first thing in the morning. I'm kind of like meandering over to breakfast, haven't had coffee yet, so I'm sure I'm just incredibly lovely. And... <laughs> He presents me a book called The Last Arrow, <clears throat> and this book is about um, it's about God, really, and it's it's about living your life uh, to the fullest extent possible and exhausting all your arrows before you die, and not living with any regrets and mm. then burning your mm. past, those things that you know bother you, so you can focus better on the future and better yourself. And it it was profoundly moving, and you know. Some other things happened as well. It, it was, but I saw it like as a kind of like a sign, literally from God saying, "Hey, man, I heard you. You're 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 yeah. coming back in. You know, you're you're okay." And since then, you know, I will tell you, um, most of like my anger, my my frustrations, 
my resentments. I just dumped them. I dumped them all. And they're gone. Like, I'm happy. That's awesome. I am, I am one with myself these days. And I'll tell you that, you know, yes, the, the treatment there was top notch. Um, but it's, it's really the giving you that time. It's 42 days. But it's giving you True. that time and space um, to work and be with others around you that have similar backgrounds and, and go through this experience together. And I, I, and a lot of it is very, it's not officially religiously based, but they, they, you know, it's God or, you know, they whatever prepare you, an atmosphere so that you can connect with God. Exactly. Whatever your higher power may be. But I will tell you that, um, if, if I think for me personally, if I did not, you know, make myself vulnerable and, you know, simply, you know, communicate with him, uh, you know, very uneditedly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a real uh, thing. Right. And then, and then also humbly request to, to be let back in. Um, it, it, for me, it made all the difference. It, it really has. And I will tell you that for our life, my, my wife and I, um, I had to win my, win my way back in, which I successfully did. I was able to complete my MBA within the time that I wanted. Um, and then we had all these other good things, uh, happen. Like our son, simultaneously when I was in treatment, believe it or not. Um, we didn't know, but he had asp he has Asperger's. He's on the Asperger spectrum and we had to commit him, uh, because an eight year old was suicidal because everybody was kept telling him how bad he was mm. school, everything. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my wife's going through that. I'm not there. And, you know, we were able to get him treated, got him in this incredible program right now, which was literally life changing, get him a diagnosis. So all this is happening to us at once. You're talking about adversity. And, you know, we were able to overcome all that. And I believe 99% of it is due to faith, due to, you know, humbly, you know, becoming a member of the flock. And, and, and here's the other thing. Um, and I think it's important. God is a warrior and, you know, God loves warriors and to be a warrior doesn't mean that, you know, you have to be in the army or you have to be a police officer or, you know, something that involves a weapon. It's a mindset. It's how you attack your life. And I say that word attack deliberately because you brought it up earlier. It's, it's not about sitting back and feeling sorry for yourself. It's about finding ways proactively to do things to get to where you want to be, right? And it's not getting the high score in a video game or, right. you know, letting the grass grow underneath your feet, as, as you mentioned earlier. It's, it's all about getting after it uh, and doing those proactive things. Like you, you're an artist. It's amazing to me. Like you have incredible talent. You're a writer. And yet you make time every day to do just that. Mm. And, and this as well. I mean, this is a great platform to spread positive message. Yeah. And so anyway, I, you know, I, I think that that's important. And, I wanted to share that with you. Can I, can, would it be okay if I share some of the text? That Absolutely. Is that all right? Yeah, okay, please. Um, after I'd sent the video, uh, some short stuff about uh, Jordan Peterson's perspective, but um, what Dave already shared, he said, I was greatly negatively affected by young loss, the quintessential loss of potential and what they could have achieved, what they could have been. And I struggled with the fact that their opportunities, their lives were cut short. And there was nothing that I could do to protect them. And that, that's a difficult feeling in any oh, yeah. situation. Yes. Family, you were talking about family. That's a difficult. That, now, like I said, most people can't relate to combat. Yeah. But everybody can relate to family. Yes. And being in a position where you are, you can become hopeless. Right. Yeah. And so um, Dave wrote, I felt violated. And this is much different than what Jordan proclaims. And uh, he said, I failed to accept God's plan for them. And I over embellish my own influence as just a man yeah. instead of accepting and honoring. Got me there for a second. Hold on. Can't cry. Sure you can. <laughs> this is, this is dude. this, this impacted me. I texted you and told you that I cried when I read this, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Um, instead of honoring their magnificent warrior deaths, I owned them, carried them with me and worse yet resented God for not protecting them and felt their deaths were unjust. Instead of thinking and accepting I did everything I could, I convinced myself that I could have done more. And here's the key, these feelings <clears throat> caused a detachment from God due to a perceived compromise of trust. Yeah. And I, I, 
you, you want to talk about that a little bit? That's, that's powerful. Because to me, when you said that, it's not just because I, I'm, I'm obviously beyond appreciative for people who give their life for our country. Yeah. You know, or for others in different scenarios. But to me, when I see that, I see a destiny to God mm -hmm. versus what we have for people. And sometimes we have to turn them over to their destiny. Mm -hmm. And that's a scary thing. So that's what I, when I read that, that was the impact yeah. for me. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, we, we can only influence what we can, right? And a lot of us, especially, you know, super A type personalities, we feel like we can control things. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I laugh because control is an illusion. And really it's, it's letting go, let, let, let go of the rope. Um, you know, that, I'm not saying not to do things deliberately and do the planning and everything else to make, make things, you know, turn out the way you would like them to. But you also at some point have to just, you know, kind of recognize that God has a plan and accept that. And then, you know, the moment you do, things become so much easier. For me personally, I, I did. I felt violated. I was like, how dare you? How could you? You know, I was so angry. It's like you took these young lives, these, these people that have, you know, just beautiful people. And I say that not, you know, not because of the way they look, some of them were good looking, <laughs> but I say it because they were uh, truly beautiful human beings, uh, people of character, people who are willing to sacrifice, people who are willing to put forth that work and effort and understand, you know, selflessness. It's, and they're, they're out there uh, getting after it and putting themselves in danger. And I, and I respected them and I honored what they did. And, you know, I saw my position as one where I, I was, had the opportunity to be able to make their lives easier and ideally protect them, make, make sure they did the planning, mm -hmm. make sure they did, you know, the due diligence before they went in a, a horrible, potentially horrible situation, or at least a very bad area where the danger is extremely high or the risk is extremely high. And instead of accepting that God has a plan for every human, um, I, I thought I, I put way too much onus on myself and what I could influence and that therein lies the conundrum, right? Um, and therein lies the resentments because when it didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, it, it kind of compromised the way I saw the world. <laughs> yeah. Even though, you know, I brought up, I was brought up, you know, studying the Bible and understanding all this. Um, you know, we, we, we suffer because we care so much and, you know, that, you, you see it in the Bible all the time. I mean, that, that therein lies the fall, right? Because of the resentments, because of the feeling of this violation and compromise. And then, you know, some of the characters or the historical figures really I, I identify it and some of them don't. And those that don't, they don't end up doing well. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> but those that do thrive. Mm. Um, so for me, uh, that was the turning point. And I, you know, you, you heard earlier, right? I spent a lot of time downrange, I did every single job uh, within Special Forces Group in combat. Um, you know, a team leader, I deployed two different teams with two different teams to combat a, a Special Forces company twice, once as an XO, one as, once as a commander. And then I was staff at many different levels from, you know, the battalion to the group. Uh, and then I ended up at uh, Joint Special Operations Command where, you know, it was global. But in each and every one of those positions, you know, you are dealing with a zero-sum game. And... The planning, the um, you know the holistic considerations, the coordination, the you know the the <laughs> I keep saying the due diligence, but it's there. And then when something goes wrong, you you have to understand the enemy always has a vote, and that's an easy way to kind of reach acceptance. But for me, it didn't quite work out that way. Um, and I at, in each one of these instances, whenever there was a loss, instead of thinking, you know, God has a plan. Um, I, I would own them and I, mm. and I carry them. And, and you're talking, let's see, from 2004 to 2016, pretty much that entire time, and either directly engaged or, you know, indirectly engaged in some capacity with some level of, um, you know, connection there, or it was people I knew. And in each one of those instances, you know, it got worse and worse. And, you know, I, it, it's funny, you know, people shape PTS as they try to characterize it or, or put it in a place where, you know, he was blown up and he experienced some bad things. Okay, that, that's one aspect of it. Um, but then what, what was affecting me was the moral injury. 
Mm. And, and, and I think sometimes, uh, well, it, it's equally as, as damaging because it affects the psyche in exactly the same way. Um, well, you have to think that any situation, different people are experiencing it differently. Yeah. So you can't really define it as one thing. No. Because it has so many different facets. It just depends on how people are dealing with it. Yeah. Like you said, some people might be godless. They might not even think about God yeah. and just think, this is what happened. I can't handle this. I mean, that could be a very it, simple. It is. But it can be as complex as trying to deal with your faith, responsibility, losing people's lives. I mean, it, it could be so many. I never thought of it like that before. Yeah. So, but that was. Yeah, one of the one of the things that, that um, I think, I mean, it's all interesting. And um, it's definitely beyond my pay grade uh, in regards to, you know, being in actual war. Um, our oldest daughter, Hannah, she destroyed Acorn, Obama's claim to fame. And um, when when that happened, uh, that saved us $8.5 billion, uh, CNN, everybody and their dog came after us trying to destroy our family. So that's why I sit on two acres with guns all, <laughs> all over my house, because it got hectic, man. And I got to tell you, I got, I don't, I don't know if I could say it's PTSD, but man, something, something made me tweak after going through that shit storm to where, you know, I, I don't look at people and situations and, and quote unquote friends the same. I'm suspect because we had a lot of people turn against us. We had a lot of people, uh, you know, try to dox us and, uh, dude, it was hectic. And again, it's not bullets flying, but it was a weird level of cultural warfare that, you know, I talk to people, Christians all the time. They're like, I just want to change the world. It's like, no, you don't. <laughs> You really don't, because if you really get into those aspects to where you alter culture, you know, where, whether it's on the battlefield or, you know, it's in uh, news or politics, man, the shit starts flying fast and furious. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, you know, properly grounded, even if you are properly grounded, you're going to go through a wood chipper. And, um, you know, what happens to you when you come out uh, the backside of that wood chip chipper, you know, hopefully you're grounded in God because it can get hectic, man. Mm. And I know a lot of people that, you know, just completely retreat from life, retreat from the battle, retreat from going there because, you know, the, the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the dues you play to sing the blues don't come easy. That's at right. All. That's right. You're, and I, here's I think, an, here's sorry. another thing that, Go ahead. that I found interested in your, interesting in your testimony. Not that, you know, there's things that are less interesting, is that I'm a huge proponent, Dave and Rich, of talking to God and just getting it all out. I mean, whether you got to cuss, whether you got to vomit, whether you got to yell, whether you got to scream, he already knows you feel and that And he way. can handle it. Yeah, he knows what you're going through. That's Absolutely. what I think uh, interesting. One of Rich's uh, favorite theologian is Charles Finney, and I used to study him a, a ton before I became a Calvinist and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, okay. Uh, We're Finn, working on Finney. reforming you. Did you get that? Yeah. <laughs> Right. So Finney, Finney said that when he would do these revivals and stuff and he would go to places that are filled with unchurched people and he would get away from, you know, the frozen chosen and the hoity toity religious crowds and stuff. He said that people would come up uh, when he would make the appeal to give your life to God. They'd come up to the front of the church, throwing their alcohol down, throwing their guns down, cussing a blue cloud. <laughs> And a lot of, you know, churchy people that were there at those environments, they're like, hey, you can't talk to God like that. And Finney's like, no, that's how you should talk to God. You know, that's how David talked to God. If you read the Psalms mm -hmm. in the original Hebrew, which I think Eugene Peterson did a great job transliterating uh, David's sentiments uh, from the original Hebrew, you see nothing but raw, guttural, just vomitous type emoting to God. Honest language. How, yeah, how David really felt. It's like, why have you forsaken me? Where have you gone? You know, I'm surrounded by lions. I'm getting gored by bulls. You know, I'm surrounded by enemies. And it's like, you just left the playing field. Are you going to leave me here alone? Am I going to die in ignominy? Is that, what, is that what this is all about, God? And then God comes in, boom. <clears throat> it's like, hey, you're my special boy. And then he takes him and he delivers him. But David vented that stuff. Mm. And I think a lot of people, when they talk to God or approach to God, and I'm not talking about being irreverent or you know right. being a dick to the Almighty. 
Um, but man, you, you got to unearth how you really feel yeah. if you want to get to where you really want to go. So I think that's interesting. The Oak tree experience. Yeah. For me, um, complete transparency and getting it all out there. You're in, it goes back to what, you know, my friend said to me, it's like, just be honest. Mm. and be genuine and you know I, I don't think there's anything more genuine than making yourself vulnerable yeah and relinquishing you know humbly relinquishing that control that you think you had mm -hmm. to that higher power whatever it may be yeah and you know that that's true vulnerability and then communicating in, <laughs> in a manner that's like it's real it's honest uh, yeah. it's just blatantly honest here's how I feel I know you can handle it you got some pretty broad shoulders um, and you're going to hear it. Whether you're well, like I remember I prayed one night for God to kill someone. <laughs> what? Yeah, I did. I was so mad. This person was attacking me. I was a young preacher. I couldn't handle anything, any criticism. And uh, I prayed that God would kill him. And I was at the bottom of my bed, on my knees, on my mattress. I don't typically pray like that, but that's what I was doing. And I was yelling at God, and I said, you know what? I want you to kill him. I want you to kill him tonight. Not tomorrow in a car accident, tonight. While he's sleeping, I want him dead. And I fell asleep. I actually woke up on the bottom of the bed. And in the morning when I woke up, I had this overwhelming sense of, I don't, I don't want that guy to die. Uh, this isn't worth it. And see, but I was honest. Yep. And, and some people freak out when I say that. But, but what happened is it opened up my heart. And the reality, got, I think the Lord was saying, is that what you really want? And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want him to die. Yeah. And I actually prayed that morning that God would bless him. I was like, can you just bless this guy? It, it'd help if you'd handle got some it of out, this though. attack. You got it out. But I didn't want right. anybody to die. I mean, yeah, but if we hold it in, that stuff holds in until it explodes in some other situation. Another thing I think that Dave was saying that I think can apply to the average person is... I'm an average person. No, you're not. Oh, yeah. But your, your life and your he's situations... A, he's an average sinner. Yeah, you're yeah. an average sinner. But your life you and your go. situations are extreme. So They when are. I, when I'm, I'm talking about just an average person, daily life that hasn't seen combat or something like that. And, and like I said, I think it's easy to dismiss what you're saying that it doesn't apply to us because we don't live like that, right? But I, but I think here's something that's practical is the truth is the disappointment, the discouragement, and the disillusionment when God doesn't do what you want yeah. or, or not what you want, not like it's a selfish, what you expect. Like say it's for a, a child and, and I've had to bury friends' children, you know? And, and those are the things yeah. that I think are real things. And that's what you're talking about. And exactly. I, it applies to everyone because you think, well, I'm trying to do this good thing. Isn't this something that's good? But God is good and his plan is ultimately good. And I yeah. think we have to accept that. And, and maturity in following Jesus is like, okay, well, I don't see the good in this and I'm not happy about it. I'm, I got to deal with it and process it. But ultimately, I'm going to trust that your plan overall is going to be for the best or the highest form of good. Yeah. That that's that takes courage. That's hard. Yeah. That that is the hardest part. Yeah. Accepting that and once you once you can get there um it's it's not you have to sustain it. Yeah. You have to sustain it. It's not just reaching that level of acceptance or, you know, committing yourself to faith. It's it's an everyday fight. Yeah. Absolutely. And and that's that's being a warrior. Yeah. Right there. So yeah, I mean, you look at uh, guys like King David, you know, mentioning him again and um, how he was a man after God's heart. He was God's special boy and he was highly favored by the Lord. Same with Joseph. Man, some of the stuff that those guys went through, most Christians nowadays, they had to flip and quit. They, <laughs> they're like, I'm out. If this is how you treat your friends, yeah. then, you know. <laughs> No wonder you don't have that many but then, people that follow you nowadays. And then David but was a warrior and a conqueror, and then the Lord told him, oh, you don't get to build the temple. There's too much blood on your hands. So you did your, the, you did your job. Ends. I needed you for that. But I got somebody else to build buildings. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. If I, yeah, if I need, again, if I need 100 again, I think, uh, foreskins I think, of the know. Philistines, I'll send you out. But, uh, <laughs> you know, building a beautiful building, we're going to let your son do that. Yeah, we got, we got somebody else for that. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I think we've gussied up, you know, what, Christianity is all about. I think we've made, you know, the life of faith, this kind of feckless thing that it's just easy peasy, summer squeezing. Yeah. And um, man, again, when you deep dive in, into the book of Psalms and you read, you know, the, the biblical narratives of the heroes and heroines of scripture, those people never freaking had it easy. They had more highs and lows than Lindsay Lohan on a combination of China white smack <laughs> 
in amyl nitrate pop and they went through more shit than Michael Moore's colon. And yet they still uh, overcame. They still prevailed. They still kicked ass. You know, they still were faithful. God showed himself mighty to them. But I, I really, man, I, I tell you what, I'm just trying to think for the Warriors and Wild Men audience. You've got to get to the level of rawness that yeah. David did at that oak tree that I did in my Ford F-150 underneath a, a parking awning where I just got down and dirty with Jehovah and, and just absolutely changed my life. You've got to get to that place where you just get raw, man, and where you just talk to God just like you're talking to somebody that, you know, sitting in front of you that gives a crap about your life. Got to mm. get that raw. Got to get that dirty. Got to get that nasty for God to break through. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's a good place to wrap it up on the next. We got another podcast that we want to do. But Dave, I want to thank you for coming on. Absolutely. And, and I think, Doug, this powerful stuff. No doubt, bro. I'm glad Dave's back on. And, and how come he's moving? What'd no, you do to know. offend him, Rick? I don't Rich? know. Yeah, that, that would be a whole other podcast to just get into the details of that. It's 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 rough. Yeah. All right, Rich, what is the Warriors and Wild Men listening? What do they got to do? They got to go to warriorsandwildmen.com, subscribe, like us, love us, leave us a comment. And uh, if you want to watch or, and listen to us on social media, you can uh, while we're still for on now. there before yeah. they kick us off. But, uh, in, but make sure you go to warriorsandwildmen.com, subscribe. It's for free. Um, we'll send you maybe one or two emails a week. We're not going to fill your inbox with a bunch of junk. If you want to help us out and support us, hit the war chest. It's tax deductible. We'll send you the information for that. And for those that are doing that, we really appreciate you guys helping out a lot. Let's send this message out farther, deeper, wider. Warriors and wild men, out. <laughs>